Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm an executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. Today, I have brought you another amazing thought leader in the industry. Um, So I'd like for you to help me welcome Vera K. Fisher, President and CEO of 97 Degrees West, the brand marketing agency. I met her at a networking event where she shared this inspiring story of how she started her marketing firm. And I was so impressed that I just knew I had to share her story with her audience. And, you know, she's got 25 years of marketing knowledge and entrepreneurship. Vera has built an incredible book of business and serves her clients with custom strategies to achieve their goals. Vera, I am so excited to have you here today and learn more about you. I am so excited to be here and thank you so much for having me on. That's so great that we could find the time. I know you're a busy lady. I think the last time we chatted, you said something about hair on fire with a client. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. There's always a lot of that. Well, that's good. So I want to dive right in. We've got some questions for you today. Um, Just want to learn more about your story and about your lifelong love of learning. Um, So my first question for you today is your agency, 97 Degrees West, has a very inspirational origin story um, about strength, resilience, and work ethic. You started your company at home with a new baby under some incredible (laughs) circumstances. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about not just the birth of your baby, but the birth of your company? Absolutely. So uh, at the time of my baby, I was being employed at a software, enterprise software company here in Austin, Texas, publicly traded, um, been there for about three years, ran their um, new generation program, uh, inside sales team. Uh, reported into the CMO, et cetera, doing a really, really great job. Went on maternity leave. Actually, four or five weeks into maternity leave, I went into the office and did what you do when you're in that type of a position. And 10 weeks into it, I get a phone call that uh, the company was restructuring and they laid off 50% of their workforce, and that included me. So let me interrupt you for just a second. Aren't you covered by like FMLA at this time? I am covered by that. Um, And there's a loophole in the whole maternity law. And that's what people don't really understand correctly. That yes, companies must have a position waiting for you when you return, but it doesn't say for how long. Ah. So I could have come to work and then the next day got laid off. But I got laid off two weeks before I was supposed to come to work. And they gave me a generous severance from one month of work. And then I, of course, got a bunch of paperwork. So that's how they get around it. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. So now you've received the call. Yeah. And thank God, goodness, because the day before I was was close with obviously you have friends at work and they warned me I was on the list. So I had time to cry <laughs> and freak out privately. Okay. And then the next day I was prepared professionally for the call and my boss cried. I didn't. I ended up consoling her like, I'll be okay. It'll be fine. Everything will be fine. And uh, so I got call and then I just was, I could not do it again. Go find a JLB and prove myself again and wake up for a baby at six in the morning, work by eight. I didn't want to do it. So I sat down at the table and I listened, I listed every CEO and VP I knew in Austin that I had worked with and knew, sent them an email, said I was available. And within a week, I had my project 
And within the first eight months, I had made enough money to survive. And then it just grew after that. That is an amazing story. And I think it's one, I think one of the lessons I take away from it is you didn't, I mean, you said you gave yourself time to cry, but you really didn't. I mean, that day, you're like, move on, fix it. You have to. Yeah. You really do. And at the end of the day, you realize that when the sun comes up tomorrow, and I, start, I know that sounds cliche, but it's true. Nothing imploded after the phone call. And nothing imploded when I went out to the email. Life just slowly but surely happened. And if it like didn't work, yeah, it exploded. And the rationale was, okay, I'm going to try this but for the amount of time that I have in my severance. If it doesn't work, I'll go get a job. I love it. I love it. And it um, so when I first met you, I had the privilege of hearing your story. And one of the patterns that I could recognize almost immediately um, throughout your whole career is your commitment to learning and developing. Um, in fact, you recently went back to Texas State to pursue your master's degree, all while running an agency, being a mother, and even sharing your knowledge as an advertising lecturer at Texas State, which is incredible. Um, what was your motivation to go back and pursue your master's? So it was on my bucket list, and I wanted to prove to myself that I could go to school and get good grades. And I know that sounds absolutely ridiculous, but my undergrad was you know, really work focused. I had to support myself and pay for school and pay for my living. So work was always number one. And I didn't get this amount of time that you really should spend in school and undergrad and taking advantage of programs and uh, teacher opportunities and all of those things. And I graduated with a really horrible GPA. And like, okay, well, not very smart. So, yeah, that's what we tell ourselves. Right. And then I said, you know, I really want to go get that master's degree. And I actually tried to do that, um, but I got pregnant in that. So, yeah. that There's said that. no to that. <laughs> yes to the kid. And then uh, at 48, I said, okay, I'm ready to try this again. And I went to my GRE. And my mind was almost bigger accomplishment than getting an actual master's degree. And uh, I passed that and got in and I just graduated in May of 2019. So, and with a 4.0. So it turns out you have the right support and structure or you can do, you can do well in school. Absolutely. That's amazing. And uh, I want to make sure our audience heard this because you're very proud of this fact. How old were you when you went back to get your master's? 48. That's what I, okay. I just want to make sure nobody missed that because it's never too late. It's never too late, you know? No, it isn't. And I love to learn. And that's the one thing that makes me who I am. And a lot of folks would, would and have called me someone who's not very content with my life or you're just not satisfied ever. And that's not the case. I like to learn. So when I learn something, I want to move on. What's next? What can I learn over here? And that is really drives me to be. So that was another thing. Most people just couldn't even stand the thought of going back to school, driving to campus, sitting in a classroom for three hours with people that are 20 years younger than you or more. That's fine. You know, and being the old lady. So, uh, and I learned a lot, by the way, from those uh, students around me, just seeing them, and they were so lovely and wonderful, great. But um, it, it's part of that whole thing of staying relevant, and you're learning a lot, and you keep doing that. So I would argue that my master's degree is probably more relevant than someone who got their master's degree 30 or 40 years ago. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt, I would agree with you. So, and, and you just said something, and it's actually one of the questions I want to ask you. So I'm, I'm hoping you'll expand on it a little bit. But I listened to your podcast on the Growth Show by HubSpot, and mm -hmm. um, you mentioned your desire to learn sometimes being interpreted by others as never being content that you just brought up, right, mm -hmm. and never being happy where you're at. But 
you describe it as a hobby and a hobby that you're extremely passionate about. Um, and of course, you want to continue to learn and there's always something more to learn. What experiences or people have you learned the most from? Wow. Okay. So in my uh, client side, the, the girl who fired, mm -hmm. who was amazing. She was one woman that I learned so much from, from a high level executive perspective. She taught me how to communicate to executives. She taught me how to write from a business perspective when you're trying to sell your ideas or um, persuade others in an organization to go down the path that you, the organization needs to go down. And uh, her name is Nancy Harris, and she knows this. I've told her this several times, and she is, she expects you to be great, and when she knows you can be, she won't settle for anything less. And so she was one of the biggest people that I really learned from in a business world. That is amazing. I love that. Um, I have been very fortunate too that, you know, it's, it's almost like when you say, okay, I need this skill. And if you're really keeping your eyes open to the opportunities, that person's going to slide into your life and you're going to get that skill you need, but you've got to be open to it. You've got to be receptive Absolutely. when that person walks by. So I think Absolutely. that mentors and coaches are so important. So, and in fact, I will tell you the story right now is speaking of my coach and you also, once you do find your coach, you've got to be receptive to what they say. Because I literally sat there and argued with my coach over something the other day. And she's like, why am I even talking to you? You're not listening right. to me. And I was like, I'm sorry. Let me shut my mouth and open my ears and listen. And she was so right. By the time we got done working through the issue, I was just like, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. And so what did I do next? I went and wrote a blog on it. So <laughs> I tried to be one of the best um, experiences with executive coaching. I was with this coach for three years, and he was also a life changer. You know, we think we like to think that we don't bring our personal biases or whatever vocabulary word we want to describe it. We don't think we bring it to work, but we do. Oh, without a doubt. You know, and and really, when she said it, when I told her what was going on, she goes, "Why do you care?" Like, because this is this, she's like, it's none of your business, you know? I was like, maybe, maybe you're right. I don't know yet, you know? <laughs> so, um, what resources do you think are out there for others that have the same curiosity and desire to learn as you? And, you know, where can they find more supportive mentors like yourself? So, finding a, let me start with the last of your question. Finding a mentor is really difficult. And it's simply because most people don't know what's in a mentor, we don't know what to ask of a mentor, and most people that are asked to be a mentor don't know what to do. So you have to come at it from a very clear quest perspective. So you need to say, I want to learn X, Y, and Z, or I need advice on situations that I'm coming up against in my workplace or in my life. And you really have to find a mentor that um, has had similar experiences, someone that you look up to and someone that you trust. I don't think age has a lot to do with it, depending on what you're looking for, because depending on where they are at the age of their career or life, they could be at a different age but at the same stage as you are. So if you want to look at that instead of the age or the title or the other extraneous, you know, and that's, again, now that you mentioned that, it just reminded me of a conversation I had. And, you know, when I first started launching my personal brand, you know, I was just like so frustrated because I was like, but look at this person. They're so much further along than me. And they've got all these podcasts under their belt already. But, you know, they had to start at the beginning, too, just like me. And right. one of the things that I thought would be helpful, because it is frustrating and there are things that happen that you're like, what do I do with that? You know? And so I started writing a blog on my personal journey to, or my journey to personal branding in real time. And mm -hmm. every time I have something happens that throws me back or I think is a major milestone, I'll go blog about it so that people can see that, you know, just because you're not where I'm at now, because I'm not in the same place I was three months ago, right? 
um, doesn't right. mean we all have to be at the same place. So I think that's what you're saying. Because, you know, there could be a 23-year-old out there who is a personal branding guru, right? And I could learn from that person, regardless of that's the right. age. That's right. So, so to your point, I think that that's such a true statement. And, you know, on the other part of your question, as far as where I learn, so one of the things that I like to do is identify patterns. And that sounds kind of crazy, but there are patterns in everything. So I read everything from, I'm very much into fashion and design and pop culture uh, all over the world. So my Instagram feed, the magazines I read, magazines or the financial magazines, I read the Financial Times, the New York Times, I read Vogue, I read uh, Architectural Digest. I mean, it runs the gamut. So you can start to see patterns in what everyone's covering. And then I start to read some of those articles, and then I'm like, okay, I don't understand what that is. So then I go look it up. And then and always, there's a book associated with it. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go get that book. I'm a hardcover book. I don't like digital books. So I order probably 10 or 12 books a month. Do I read them cover to cover? Do I read books? No. I thumb through them. I tag them, and then I just do this. Do you every highlight month. as you're reading? I don't. I actually use pencil. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. You did the same thing I no, did. No, but no, I have a form of highlighting. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then what ends up happening is something that I've read about or learned about or talked about actually shows up in my life 12 months later. Oh, I remember this. Oh, that's. And it's just this compound effect. It's a little bit every other day or every day or on the weekend because I enjoy it. I don't want to do it. And then over the last 30 years, it just accumulates. I love that. And I think um, and I think that's probably why you and I hit it off so much is because I have a very similar learning style. And I'm, and I'm so bad. I'll probably read like and I do read my books cover to cover, um, but I will have like four or five books that I'm reading at any given time on different subjects. You know, there exactly. might be one on professional development. There might be one on, uh, oh, what am I reading right now? I actually started reading Tony Robbins, Awaken the Giant. Oh, that's a good one. Have you read it? I have. It's really good. Yeah. So, it's great to go back and read it again. Yeah. Yeah. That one and um, Think and Grow Rich, of course, is a favorite. I've read that twice. Oh, I just learned today, and I had no idea, that there's a Think and Grow Rich for women. I think I knew that, but I don't know if I've read I can't remember if I've read that one. Well, I'm definitely, I'm like you. Like, I have a problem when it comes to books, and I will order them as soon as I, usually the way I find my books is from a podcast. Like, some author will be on a podcast, and they'll be like, that's interesting, and so I'll go order the book. So I have... Right? A stack of like 12 books. No, I'm not going to lie. I probably have more than that that I haven't read. Well, and I'm also a, I'm a fast reader. So if I'm reading just for pleasure on a two to three hour plane flight, I can finish a 300 page book. Oh, from start I to wish yeah. I could read that fast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so it's pretty fast. It's, but that's fast. Yeah, that's really fast. Have you heard of an app called Blinkist? I have. Have you I used it? it? Okay. I have. Here, I thought I was going to share something new and wonderful and wow, yeah. <laughs> Great. It's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. You know, another thing that I do with the whole learning that if for people that don't like to read, there's a lot of people out there that don't read, right? They don't want to read the book. It's just not their gig. Um, I, in every race environment that I'm in, whether it's client, peer, agency, or friends, I ask so many questions about how does that work? How do you do that? Why is that important? So asking questions, being really sincere about wanting to get the answer is also another great way to learn. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Um, so what has been the scariest challenge or risk mm -hmm. that you've had to take on as an entrepreneur? And how did your curiosity help you overcome it? Well, just being an entrepreneur and having to make payroll in and of itself is what scares you to death. 
It is uh, not a secure existence involved any sweat, uh, but the neighbors being an employee, you don't have control over that. And uh, the fear will go through you and you think you are going to lose your mind because you're so scared. And then you just have to let it go and kind of run through it and but you can learn how to manage it. It never really goes away. So it diminishes in its power to impact. And uh, for me, um, the curiosity and the learning, that's when I really started looking at like universal laws and not necessarily the law of attraction, but how do other people get over it? And with the internet, social media, and videos, and Facebook, we start to learn that, wow, everybody's scared. How great is that? I'm not the only one. So you start to read more about how they're scared or how they overcame. Once you realize you're not alone, that really helps. So then you start to say, okay, what am, what's the worst thing that could happen? And my whole thing is, for the last 15 years of this business, that if it fails completely, I'm smart enough to go get a job. I wake up every day and say, do you want to go get a job? And then the answer is no. I'm good. Get out there and hustle. <laughs> get out there, get out of bed, and go hustle. It's exactly right. <laughs> That is so awesome. Um, another thing that I love about your commitment to being a lifelong learner is that uh, you've used that passion in your agency to best serve your clients as well. And on the agency website, you mentioned your potential customers are thinking about buying from you or a competitor right now. Before they do, they have questions, objections, misconceptions, and concerns that need an answer. Inbound marketing is that answer. So talk to me a little bit more about the inbound methodology and how you came to research it and eventually adopt it and master it. So about six years ago, the, um, I finally relinquished the fact that I was going to have to learn digital. There was no way around it. And I was one of the naysayers of you know, 40 years old, 42 years old. I'm like, I'm not doing social media. I don't understand it and I don't care. And there's a lot of folks out there that are still this way. Finally, I got to the realization, which I always do, reluctantly sometimes, that I needed to up my game in that area if I was going to be relevant. Agency was going to be relevant. So I started researching marketing automation, the different platforms that were out there, and I settled on HubSpot. And I um, ended up contracting with them, becoming a HubSpot agency, and I just dove in head first. I did it all myself. I went through the methodology and really it's education. And that's the interesting thing about this whole inbound thing. It's all about education. It's not selling stuff. It's how do you run your business better? How do you market better? What's lead generation? How do you pick out digital media? It's education, education. So that married up with my CDC. And I learned and spent years and I still do figuring out what's next digital, what's happening in the digital world, which um, a thing that I didn't see happening was now I get asked to speak at different conferences on digital. How do you do it? When do you do it? What is it? How complicated is it? With the technology moving so quickly and our ability to advertise and send messages less to people, it's getting more and more complicated but scary and but it's fun because I'm still learning some stuff. So that's how I do that. Okay. Okay. Um and, and you kind of mentioned this, but some of the pillars of that inbound methodology is building that trust and the educating, just like you just said. Um I think these are also very important pillars in the job search. Building trust, um, building trust with employers, and educating them about your skill set and expertise. How can someone that's searching for a job accomplish these? How can they accomplish, you know, that trust and educating? So one thing that I believe that candidates don't understand is that there are four and sometimes five generations in a workforce. 
So if I'm a millennial or if I'm a Gen Xer or if I'm a baby boomer or if I'm a Gen Z, the last generation as they call it now, you have to understand who your audience is and you have to understand how to communicate with that audience. So for instance, in my generation, especially in the advertising world, the typo on your resume, you're out. Oh, yeah. And that may seem ridiculous to a millennial or a Gen Z, but no, it's not. If you don't have attention to detail, didn't proof it, you have no pride of work. Now, those are three things are what comes through when you have typos or grammatical mistakes on a simple resume, right? There's also, um, in my experience, really understanding the company that you're applying with. You know, who are they? Where did they come from? Who are the team members? Where did they come from? And really showing and digging in deep. And I also learned at the university side, they don't teach that. And that's why someone like you in your area of so critical is that you're teaching them new information that you think they were supposed to learn in school, but they didn't because it was never there. Okay, exactly. So what's next for you? You know, I have a lot of fun things going on. Um, I'm doing a lot of fractional CMO work okay. for some of my clients, which I'm thoroughly enjoying. I get to be at that, that level at the executive table and the 25 years of seeing different business models and different leaders and their failures and their successes at global levels, at regional levels, I'm bringing all of that learning to bear to these different clients from that perspective, and that is really fun. Uh, my daughter graduated from high school in three years, so company agency will be 16 in a few or 16 years in two months when we turn 16. And after that, I don't know. I'm we'll sure see. something will speak to you. Yeah. <laughs> something I'm, I'm hoping that just by being open and not being the big planner that I typically am, that it'll open the door wide enough for opportunities to show up that I had never even thought of. Well, you never know. We talked about something earlier that might be an opportunity. Sure did. That <laughs> sounds very, very interesting. <laughs> Everybody else will just have to wonder. That was that's right, girl, right. Girl, girl secret. <laughs> so I have three questions that I like to ask all of my guests, and they're a little mm -hmm. out there. So I would like oh, to I'm ask ready. you our VIP questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. If you were one of, if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three people or things would you take with you? Oh, Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, you got to have the humor. Okay. <laughs> that, that's a new one. Right? It, uh, it like I would things. also, and, and things too, right? But I only get three. Only three. Okay, so the interesting thing about going to Mars is there's no ethics. The whole ethical construct of ethics is a humanistic thing, and there's no humans on Mars, and you would be the first one. Okay. So you have to construct the entire ethical paradigm of what is right and wrong. So to that note, I'd like to have you know, maybe an Aristotle or Plato or one of the older philosophers as a book to take with me. Okay. I know that's way out there. I love it. It really speaks to your lifelong learning. It really does, right? How, how can that possibly help you out on Mars? Yeah. And then, you know, I'd have to have a belt. Okay. Right? Fellas are, you gotta have a belt. Fellas are important. I mean, I got Ellen to make me laugh. I got a book to help me learn some stuff. And then I got to have the Bella. As long as he stays on the other side half the time and leaves me alone. <laughs> so you can set up the ethical paradigm. You got to have time for that. That's and then I can Busy test it out. Even on Mars. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, that was that was a really good answers. Um, so this is one of my favorite questions. What is the one thing you do to start your day and set you up for success? Oh, that's a good one. Okay. So uh, first of all, I don't rush in the morning. Cannot do it. So I have at least an hour, hour and a half doing nothing before I actually have to get ready for the day, and it varies. Between 
uh, reading the Times, the Financial Times, or um, taking a walk at six in the morning in the dark, or having a cup of coffee. It's really a lot of nothing. Okay. But it is something. It's, I wouldn't call that nothing. You know, of late, it's been just sitting outside and looking at the stars. You know, quiet time is underrated. Oh, I agree. You know, I mean, one of the things that I do every morning is meditate and that's my time to just ground, you know, and just kind of clear the chatter out of my head. Right. Exactly. I don't go so far as the meditation yet um, because I can sit and be quiet and not think about anything. See, not many people can do that. They have to. So you are actually kind of meditating because that's what meditation is. Right. Yeah, I guess it is. I never yeah. really thought about it like I'm compartmentalized. I compartmentalize. So I'm very, it's very easy for me to put some boxes in my head and say, oh, I'm taking that box down and I'm going to think about that. Oh, nothing. I'm going to put that box up there. Oh, girl, you need to teach people how to do that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a gift. Um, okay, my final question for you. If your I life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, that is so hard. About, about the business, about my business. Do what? Say, say, read the question. Say the question one more time. Okay. If your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? She always told a good story. I like it. I like it. So Vera, how do people get in touch with you? You can reach me at my uh, email, Vera, V-E-R-A, at 97bwest.com. You can also get me on LinkedIn. Uh, I use my middle initial, Vera K. Sister, F-I-S-T-H-E-R. Send me a, a DM on that. Yeah, and mention that you saw her on the VIP podcast if you connect with her on LinkedIn. So she'll know to definitely, you know, connect back with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome. I just have one last thing to say to you, Vera. You are a VIP. Thank you. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.